Hello, I'm Alexander, CEO of Sandbox Geometry. I want to talk with you today about a quantum level parametric geometry I use to construct and bond like atoms together. It all begins with curved space central force mechanics. I explore central force curved space using a computer based mechanical contrivance called a curved space division assembly. Take code for a unit circle, add code for a unit parabola, and we have a parametric CSDA. What makes the CSDA perfect for shaping central force energy curves is the dependent curve initial focal radius P is congruent with the pi over two spin radius of the independent curve at inception. I can now track central force spherical happenings using a square space profile F of R. Counting with infinities. I realized early the unit circle could be population curvature. Beyond the circumferential boundary lay radii of curvature, a working central force CSDA. So even on outside the boundary of curvature, we have unit one, macro infinity, unit two, macro infinity, unit three, macro, on and on and on and on. Fits perfectly for a basic G field orbital, R F of R for position, position energy. Sir Isaac's displacement radius and tracking displacement energy on the dependent period time curve. My, I use the S and T one, stands for space and time square one, is what I use to analyze and construct massive G field space curve. I use book bookend position vectors to define energy limits of an orbit period. I use energy tangent slope to determine orbit velocity. The curved time diagonal has a complete history of orbit curvature. Let's build a space-time square for the uh, Earth and Moon. I reference orbit, uh, orbit curve limits as high energy and low energy, not perihelion, aphelion, apogee, and perigee. We're going to have to convert the square, uh, kilometric square space parameters, the green column, into unit numbers for uh, ratios of a CSEA reference frame, the orange column. The way we're going to do it, you're going to take the average radius, 384, 400 units, and that's going to be the denominator of all comparatives. On the numerator, we're going to put all the event parameters, and you multiply everything outside the unit circle by 2, and everything on the unit circle and in the unit circle has potential multiplied by 1. Now the lattice rectum and Sir Isaac Newton universal law, all orbit curves, this is a profile of a CSDA, all orbit curves are relative with the energy on the system lattice rectum diameter. This high energy curve and low energy curve and the lattice rectum diameter is the average energy and of the orbit itself. Now what I want to do, I'm going to use that fact, I'm going to change Sir Isaac Newton universal law just a little bit down here, M1 and M2. Uh, we'll never change in our lifetime as, and roll them in with the constant of proportionality g. We now have k times 1 over r squared, which is the constant of proportionality times the curvature squared. And we just got through saying that the unit circle, I like to use it because that's a population of curvature. So now we want to construct the radius. This is a high energy orbit curve. One thing you'll notice with CSDAs, all orbit energy, motion energy curves maintain contact with what I call a curved space directrix and always contact with the field potential. Now there's two ways to get in this curve. One is a basic subtraction. We know what the focal radius is going to be. The focal radius is up here is 1.8932. We also know the potential curve is one. So you take one away from the focal radius, you're going to have a radius energy curve for 0.8932 units. We can also use Sir Isaac Newton's universal law. The event curvature is 1.8902. Curvature evaluation for that would be 1 over 1.8902 squared times 4, the lattice rectum. The lattice rectum of every curved space anal analytics is the constant of proportionality. Now, this is a curvature term. You have to invert it to get the radius. The radius turns out to be of the energy curve is 0.8932 which is what we had up here. Now this is a low energy curve, and this is the energy tension that changes slope and gives us the velocity of the various orbits. I have put something new in here. It's called an insul insulator tangent. 
The insulator tangent I use to keep separate the opposing forces of attraction and escape, which every gravity field seems to have. And now that what's here is the event radius to here to the spin radius. We see that the insulator tangent and the energy tangent intercept at exactly one half the radius, showing the equal distribution of energy, orbit energy across space of half the potential, half the motion. It's a zero sum, perfectly balanced system. It goes on for millions and millions of years. This, we're doing the same thing again. I got an insulator tangent. This is a high energy tangent. And it meets here in the middle of the uh, displacement radius from AC is the displacement radius for this construction. But I'm explaining that the mode of energy curves change shape. Now the previous one, the low energy curve was bigger than this. So the high energy curve is a lot smaller. They change shape to accommodate conserved angular momentum experienced by changing orbit event radius. Lines and curves with quantum structures. I wondered, I, I start, I, somewhere I wondered about constructing a dependent parabola curve within the unit circle, and it did fit perfectly. Now, this is not a unit circle. This now is the radius two unit. We're looking at quantum type structures. In fact, it's a helium atom. I weight the electron cloud with a Z number. So this is a helium atom, and to construct the unit curve in here, the, the, the binding parabola, I call it, and it it's perfectly leg to leg on the spin rotation of the uh, atom itself. I um, work two CSDA, relative CSDA space and time squares. S and, S and T2 is for micro infinity, realm of curvature, quantum fall, and S and T1, we just went over with gravity, is for macro space, radius of curvature. Note, two dependent parabola curves, one red and one blue unify one spin and rotation axis across both infinities. Well, we have motion and the G field motion. That was easy enough. That's gravity field. They uh, uh, is, is visible and can be measured with time. But what are we kind of, what kind of mechanical energy are we going to look for in uh, at the quantum level or at the nuclear level? I'm going to be I will be concerned with thermodynamics. I'm gonna, my geometry is going to be concerned in and trying to read nuclear temperature stress. Now, bonding of two elements, a latent heat, sensible heat, and saturation. These are very important terms in refrigeration. Bonding of two elements will require temperate cooperation. This slide defines terms I will use to monitor nuclear thermal happening. Sensible heat can be construed as an elementary step function of calculus. This is solid, uh, slope of state solid, slope of state liquid, and slope of state gas. To climb or fall, one degree temperature on slopes of state require one calorie of thermal energy in or out to get it done. Direct attention to both plateaus. From the beginning to end of either plateau, thermal energy is still being absorbed or relinquished without change in temperature. Flatline thermal energy activity is called latent heat. Latent heat cannot be sensed as it is the energy required by the nucleus to leap the bounds of perceived state. Though we cannot meter latent heat, we can watch it as evidenced by saturation. A glass of water is a great example. Saturation is a quasi mix of solid and liquid or liquid and gas. The two red lines meter a chronological median, median uh, middle, middle ground for both saturation events. Saturation event one changes the fixed shape of a solid into the variable shape of a liquid. At your end, it marks the place in time and space for one half solid and one half liquid. Saturation event two changes the fixed volume of a liquid into the variable volume of a gas and marks the place in time and space for half liquid and half gas saturation. Exploring fusion and vaporization using space and time two. S and T two has a linear diagonal connecting nuclear corner E right here and the E cloud corner F. The diagonal produced links nuclear rotation and spin a and B with the quantum quarters of S and T2. 
I use this collinear geography to meter nuclear latent heat happenings. Note the event five happening on the closed neighborhood J shaped with the initial focal radius T. This is the initial focal radius from here to here. J does so by reading thermal registration from rotation, thermal registration from spin, and thermal registration from the quantum corners of S and T2. It's all collected at event five. If all four registers, rotation, spin, nuclear corner, and e-cloud corner read fusion or vaporization environment, this atom is transition ready to change phase. Latent heat thermometers. We need a thermometer, a nuclear thermometer, to see what also see what's going on down there. Let the, uh, levy, the heavy teal line with the base X designate my late lithium latent heat thermometer. It's also congruent with the positive Y axis here. This is what I'm talking about. This is a latent heat thermometer. The thermometer is linear congruent twice with nuclear spin, each side of the liquid boundary separating solid and gas. Nuclear thermal energy disturbance in the neighborhood of K. Any thermal energy operating in here is going to affect the thermometer, much the same as temperature will change volume column in a liquid bulb thermometer. When moving across liquid phases, temperate stress on element population in this particular model can be vapor or fusion, depending on whether it's going hot or cold or cold or hot. Latent heat thermometers register this temperate stress, signaling when vibration oscillation chaos of rotation spin and SMT2 quantum corners are sufficient to transition perceived state for a single atom. There is a sixth collinear event, a nuclear stress hyperbola. The stress hyperbola asymptote has an interesting intercept with the nuclear latent heat thermometer, and that's the abscissa is going to be Z number over Z number minus one. And the ordinate's going to be Z number squared over Z number minus one. For our lithium atom, which we're working with right here, it's going to be the abscissa is going to be three over two, and the ordinate's going to be nine over two. This is at event F. The sixth event orchestrates transition resonance of an entire population. When all atoms of the collection read the same registration boundaries of fusion or vaporization and experience nuclear stress asymptote intercept with their internal latent heat thermometer, then and only then will the entire group population flip perception of state. Nuclear construction protocol, constructing atom one. All nuclear parameters source and protein as a primitive for all standard. To begin any element construction, we need the binding parabola focus T, closed neighborhood of J and a positive lattice rectum, over radius endpoint location C. Coordinate C will provide all the information we need. I want C because I'm, gonna I'm interested in constructing tangents to a curve. So we need the first derivative for protein, and the answer is going to be minus 2t. Every lattice rectum cord meets the curve loci with endpoint slope m plus or minus 1. We want the first quad down ta e tangent, so set the first derivative minus 2t to minus 1. The answer is going to be a half. This is abscissa location of the slope 1 energy tangent. Substitute into dependent term for the ordinate, and the answer is 3 quarters. The lattice rectum endpoint where unity tangent is abscissa is a half, the ordinate is 3 quarters, and the unit 1 spin radius minus the ordinate will give us P at one quarter. So the neighborhood J, construction parameter is one quarter cosine T, one quarter sine T plus three quarters. Constructing the nuclear corner for protium. E-cloud corner is easy enough. That's this set of numbers over here. You have sissa is always a Z number and the ordinate will always be twice the Z number. It's the uh, nuclear corner, we got to do a little bit of analytic geometry. Let one quarter be the initial focal radius for the closed neighborhood of J. Then the shaping curve na closed neighborhood K of nucleus will be congruent with neighborhood J. This is protium. We know it that it's the, uh, that this line is one quarter. So we got a right triangle proportional here. And we know that P is one quarter and T, this leg T will give us the radius of the nuclear binding energy curve. So we go down here, it's one quarter square, squared equals two T squared, so for T, the answer is one over four root two. Use the radius of nuclear binding energy curve as the hypotenuse to find the abscissa for the nuclear corner of S and T2. So 
again, we're going to do the same thing again. I know this is a, because this is actually, there's a very thin line in here. This is actually a, a squaring asymptote of the shaping hyperbola. So it goes right through the nucleus and it's a, it's a it's plus and minus one slopes on these, on these lines. So we're going to have over one over four root two squared. It's going to be two T squared. And the answer is going to be one eighth. So the abscissa is one eighth and the ordinate of it will always be the Z number plus the abscissa. So you make a common fraction, eight eight plus one eight is nine eighths is the uh, ordinate. Constructing lithium atom number one. This construction parameters of all period elements are sourced from protein. I use a table of protein meter to determine parameters for the construction. Going from protein to lithium via table parameters. Z number one is hydrogen. Z number three is lithium. So P for the protein is going to be one quarter. You want P for lithium, three times a quarter is three quarters. Lattice rectum end point. Three times a half, three halves. Three times three quarters, nine quarters. The nuclear corner, three times one eighth is three eighth. Three times nine eighth is 27 over eight. And the all important bond ring, three times 15 over eight, 45 over eight, three times 17 over eight, 51 over eight. Take these parameters, code them, put them into construction. You will have constructed lithium atom number one with respect to the Cartesian coordinate center. What's most important about this construction is the shaping hyperbola produced and the E tangent normal produced meet here at the bond ring center. And that provides us the lithium bond plane north of atom one. You can confirm bond ring coordinates by setting the shaping hyperbola equal to the E unity tangent normal. Now we've got to determine nuclear center for atom number two. Shaping hyperbolas act as springs of connect. If atom two comes in too fast because of temperate chaos, hyperbola springs collapse and restoring energy pushes atom two and atom one apart. Bond plane is a minimal distance of two atom connect. Nuclear center atom two is twice the ordinate atom one bond ring. The ordinate's 51 over eight. So twice that's gonna be 51 over four. This is atom number two constructed on the spin axis north of atom one. 3 cosine t, 3 sine t plus 51 over 4. The nuclear shaping curve, the neighborhood k, 3 quarter cosine t, 3 quarter sine t plus 51 over 4. The nuclear binding energy curve wrapped by k, 3 over 4 root 2 cosine t, 3 over 4 root 2 sine t plus 51 over 4. And atom 2 shaping hyperbola. Shaping hyperbolas are plus and minus square root z number squared plus t squared. We want the down curve. So it's going to be minus the z number squared is going to be 9 plus t squared plus 51 over 4. Those parameters allow the construction of the shaping hyperbola for atom 2 at the south spin axis. And shaping hyperbola atom 1 meets shaping hyperbola atom 2 in the bond ring center, as does the E tangent normal of atom 2, E tangent normal of atom 1. Atom 2 is joined with atom 1. They share a common bond plane. Electromagnetic phenomena of atom one bond with atom two. A line in quantum parametric geometry has width of an electron joining two endpoints of charge, positive and negative. Let the second, let the E cloud have negative potential. As such, we can imagine quantum electromagnetic potential as plasma filaments connecting positive and negative endpoints of charge between the north neighborhood P Atom one red circuit partnership with nuclear binding energy curve K of atom two. Atom two at atom one circuit is blue. So, E cloud potential. Atom one will gather in neighborhood J and leave through the north spin axis. Now, this is the red circuit. It goes to the bond ring and then from there it connects directly to the nuclear center of atom two. Atom two E cloud potential collects in neighborhood J exits through the south spin axis of atom two. This is the blue circuit, goes to the bond ring and then hooks directly to the nuclear center of atom one. Once bonded, atom one and atom two potential use their shaping hyperbolas to leave E cloud space. The surface of bonded hyperbolic shaping curves are alive with potential akin to a Van de Graaff generator. 
atom one and atom two connect their shared potential across the bond ring, provide a quantum level conduit, negative charge of electron cloud to positive a partner atom nucleus center after separating magnetism followers from the electric filament properties in the bond ring. Filament circuits carry phenomena, current phenomena. Consider elementary right-hand rule structuring magnetic field lines surrounding a wire conductor. A nuclear right-hand thumb does not travel a filament profile path with the potential, but points towards terminal nuclear centers along the spin axis. Clockwise atom two toward atom one and counterclockwise atom one toward atom two. When these north and south and sourced magnetons meet in the bond ring, they lock with north and south magnetic attraction and remain captured in the bond ring as pure magnetism, becoming principal strength of bond, leaving the negative potential of the element from an electron cloud to connect with the partnered atom positive charge nucleus. Magnetism is a gripping phenomenon of bond. The stripping of electricity and magnetism into separate single entities they happen to be provide a natural load by doing work, producing heat, and in so doing prevent explosive property of a direct contact of same charge or charge to ground without load energy consumption. That uh, completes my presentation. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, now it's now is our time for Q&A. If you have any questions, you can click the raise your hand and then Alexander can uh, allow you to speak if you have a microphone or you can type into the pathable chat and he could answer any questions there. You know, I have one more thing I can show you in the Mathematica. Okay, well, let me see if we can pull it up. There's something interesting about a CFTA, if you've got a few minutes. Uh, I do, I also explore uh, curved uh, square space math. Now this is slim, uh, spin, slope, and roots. What I've done here is constructed the fifth root of 13. What's interesting to me is that uh, Square space is zero is a polynomial to find uh, the roots. Now, curve space is zero slope. It is amazing. Now, these two solution curves are coming in from the negative side of spin. They zero, flat, flat line at the poles, and then they die for the solution root. This here is an abscissa identity for the fifth root of 13. And um, <clears throat> even indices do the same thing. But we have two solutions with even indices, one on each side of negative and positive spin. This is, uh, they, they, it does come up and it will always, they always flat line, go to zero, and then they go finding their solution roots, where they came from or where they're going. Just some of the interesting stuff that I, I find working with these curve-based fanatics. I, I really, in, really get into it, I enjoy it. <laughs>